I want to try to conclude this this morning. I didn't get done this morning, so I probably won't, but in the first service. But I want to talk to you this morning about some things that most of you know we've been doing a series called Spiritual Warfare. How many of you would agree that I don't think there's anybody in this room that isn't going through some sort of trial or situation in their life that they could learn to overcome in a better way through the Lord? But how many of you know that as we walk in God and we allow the Spirit of God to lead us and direct our lives and bring us into a, a place that we've never known, how many of you know that we have to do that through our inner man and not our outer man? And what I mean by that is, I mean that the power of God works in us and then it affects the flesh. How many of you would agree that it's really challenging that the flesh tries to rule over the spirit? And how many of you know Paul, even who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, said, I don't do the things I would like to do, and sometimes it's hard because I do the things I know I shouldn't do. Right. Now, I don't know if anybody in here ever feels like that, but this preacher feels like that a lot of times. Amen. That I mean, a lot of things I want to do, and a lot of things spiritually, even in my own life, but how many of you know I'm not where I used to be, I'm not where I want to be, but I'm on my way. Yes. Anybody in here? And by saying that, I literally mean that how many of you know even spiritual warfare in our life is a, is a walking through life. It is a process. Right. And how many of you know that the Word tells us that there is a time in all of our lives where we need to get off the milk and get on the meat. On. But how many of you know that even when a child does that, we yeah. do that in a sense of a time span. How many of you know you don't remove all formula from them and then just give them steak every day? <laughs> Why? Because literally, I mean physically, and I believe the physical parallels the spiritual, because if we did that, their digestive system would shut down. And they would have a hard time dispelling the waste and can I tell you, if God did everything for us in the beginning like that, what would happen is if we didn't have to go through this process of being weaned off the milk onto the meat, what would happen is truthfully, we would not know how to dispel the darkness sometimes that's in our lives. Because how many of you know that even though you walk in the light, there is darkness beyond these four walls that is trying to capture your eyesight, your feelings, your emotions, and all of these things that as you walk out of here. And how many of you know that if you don't recognize the battlefield that you're on, then how many of you know you can fall into the pits, or if you will, the pitfalls and the mind traps and the strongholds that come into our lives? So what I want to do this morning is I want to try to elevate us to a place that I believe personally every Christian needs to walk in discernment. I don't think it's just one of the, the gifts that's to the church. I think it's a gift to every church person that knows Jesus Christ. Because how many of you know, one of the things I'm going to talk about this morning is learning how to keep strongholds, darkness, and those things out of your life. And how many of you would agree that if you walk in discernment of that, it's much easier to get it out before it gets in than it is once it gets in than trying to get it out. Amen. Come on, church, are you here? Because literally we all know that once we open the door to something, it's a lot harder to shut the door to it. Amen? Amen? But if you have the discernment to not let it in in the first place, how many of you know it's a lot easier to keep out? Right. Um, it's it's kind of like they say really, and, and listen to me very carefully, because I, I think this is, is so strong. They say drugs, a certain type of drug, particularly cocaine, rock cocaine, you can do it one time and you'll be hooked for life if you're not careful. One time. You just open the door one time and it comes in and it becomes an addiction from then on. Right. Do you know there's other things in our life like pornography that's exactly the same way they're finding? That there is such an addiction to that. And I will say that in this room. I really will. That probably one out of every six or seven men have watched pornography this week in this room. And now it's even becoming a problem with women. Which, I mean, you know, as a man, I think women don't go by their eyesight. You have to woo them, bring them flowers. Yeah. <laughs> Some bling every now and then, you know. I mean, yeah. 
How many of you know that always helps? Come on, church, are you here? I mean, men and women are different. But how many of you know that in the spirit realm, it's exactly the same way? We can open ourselves up to a stronghold in our lives. And really, once it's, it gets there, once it, it really, if you will, digs and takes root, it's a lot harder to get out than if you keep it out all along. Come on, church. Because what I want to talk about this morning, I really believe in my heart, is probably one of the challenging things of all of our lives. And so in Corinthians chapter 10, beginning with verse 3, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Everybody say pulling down. Pulling down. Now the reason that he call, says pulling down, how many of you know, he doesn't say just take out. He doesn't say just do away with it. He says it's got to be pulled down. And let me tell you why he says that. Because if you understand anything about a stronghold, a stronghold is something that's lifted itself against the knowledge of God. And it's actually a high thing. It's in the heights of your mind or your life. And if you don't learn to pull it down, how many of you know, then you will even worship that, not intentionally, you will worship that over God. That's right. Now listen to me very carefully, because listen to what it says next. Casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Come on. So in other words, when the enemy is after our heart and our mind, how many of you know he is there to set up strongholds? He's there to set up lofty things that we will really worship even over God. And how many of you know that when we not intentionally... But what we do, what worship is, what a lot of people don't understand about worship, it isn't what we do in here. That is singing. But how many of you know worship is something you will look at every day and praise and think of and focus on and give your attention to? You worship that. So if you give your thoughts and intention and power to the knowledge of God, you worship God. But if you do that in anything else on this earth or in your mind, how many of you know you give worship to that? Now listen to me very carefully. And being ready to purge, or excuse me, bringing every thought into captivity. Everybody say every thought. Because that's where it begins. How many of you know that we don't have a lofty thing or a stronghold until we give attention to it? And we don't just glance at it. That means even Jesus dealt with this when he talked about the love of money, lust of life or lust of the eye. When he talked about seeing yourself beat down rather than set free. When you give attention to that, you become captive in your mind to how you feel and your emotions versus what's going on in the spiritual realm of what God has given you. Now listen to me very carefully. And being ready to purge all disobedience when obedience is fulfilled. How many of you know that to be purged... In fact, what I really want to do, I want to take some time right now and I want to break this down. I want to kind of melt it down. How many of you know if you're going to eat the elephants, you've got to eat it one bite at a time? <laughs> or you won't be able to swallow. So what I want to do is I want to break this scripture down probably over the next two weeks. And I want to really show you some things, some areas in our lives that really if we are going to be able to overcome, we are going to have to look and see exactly what God is telling us, what Paul is telling us through his writings. And the first thing that he says is this. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Now the word according means to be in agreement with or to conform to. How many of you know that you can be a Christian but not understand the spiritual parts of life? You can be born again but still give all the attention to the flesh. 
and the hurts and the wounds and the situations. But what he's really saying here is though we walk in the flesh, if we are going to deal with these things, we will not be able to deal with them in the flesh. For that which is flesh is flesh, and that which is spirit is spirit. How many of you know the enemy, when he comes into, when he came into this world, he came in to do one thing, and that is once we came here to rule and reign, as Jesus sent us in Genesis 2, to have dominion, everybody say dominion, dominion. over the powers of darkness and over everything on the earth. How many of you know we have an adversary that wants to stop us from doing that? We have an adversary that says, well, if you just look at the flesh, that's where you will live. But Jesus came that we may have life and have it more abundantly. Amen? Amen? So in other words, our gifted life is not in heaven. It is right now. Just look at your neighbor and say, I am to live victorious, to live victorious. Today, today, tomorrow, tomorrow. and forevermore. forevermore. Now give the Lord a praise clap if you really believe that. Because you've got to, we've got to understand that though we walk in the flesh, we don't war against the flesh. And can I tell you, most of us try to deal with things in the flesh instead of letting the spirit loose and doing spiritual things that we might over... Let me be transparent with you. How many of you know that when the flesh has its own way, it feels good for a season? Yeah, yeah that's right. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, it's not like, it isn't like, oh, that terrible sin. No, the flesh loves to sin. I'll try that over here. I mean, the flesh really feel, wants to feel good. So much that it will go out of its way to really override the spirit or the knowledge of God. And he said, if you try, that's why I really believe this in my heart. This is why when we try to do a behavioral change, it's very challenging because most of us deal with it in the flesh. Instead of really fasting, praying, being in the Word, allowing the spiritual things of our life, praying in tongues more that week, or the days we're trying, the 21 days that were... Because do you know if you change something for 21 days, you can break it? But let me tell you this, if you don't fill it with something... That empty void will be there, and if we don't let God to fill it, then the world will fill it again with something else. Boy, I'm preaching better, pretty good here. Because we need to understand where we're going with this. Because if we're ever going to learn to be overcomers in life, we are going to have to understand we can't fight in the flesh. We've got to fight in the spirit. And it's spiritual things that we've got to connect to before the flesh can really get ruled over. Because the flesh loves its own way. The flesh loves to feel good. Sin even feels good, like I said. I mean, it feels good. And this is why people, many people have a hard time giving things up because it feels good to the flesh. And how many of you know the flesh likes to feel good? But Jesus said you have to crucify the flesh every day. How many of you know a crucifixion is not real cool to the flesh? I mean, even Jesus said, Lord, if it possible, let this cup pass from me. Why? Because when you crucify the flesh, it's challenging. It hurts. It's tough. I mean, to really be a strong Christian, it's not for the faint at heart. I don't care what, you know, people say, oh, it's the opium of the masses. Oh, man, you Christians. No, try being a Christian, a real Christian. I mean, I know a lot of men that are very tough, but they're panty waste when it comes to Christianity. Well, I better not go there. Hallelujah. <laughs> so it says, according to the flesh, listen to this, subject to the body yes. as coming into the mind or the soul. How many of you know you won't deal with it in the mind or soul? You have to deal with it in the spirit. Now listen to me very carefully because this next thing is so absolutely imperative that all of us, it is paramount in all of our lives really to really learning how to live for God. And this is what he says, because he actually gives us our tools, our weapons. He says these words, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. Let me say something to you. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Now a weapon is this. A weapon is any instrument used to inflict harm, or kill another. 
any means of attacking a defensive position. Now, what he's saying here is he is saying to us, first of all, our weapons are not of this world, but they're of the spirit world. And if we are going to overcome, we've got to learn what our weapons are. And it tells us in Ephesians 6, the weapons of our warfare are the armor of God, the power of the truth, the anointing of God, the sword of the Spirit. I almost went out, I, I said in the first service, I almost went out and bought a great big Viking sword this week. Just so I could carry it around up here. But I remember one of my daughters, uh, years ago we went down to... Pastor Burnell's, when they did a great huge meeting, we took I think two or three buses down there and, and we just really enjoyed it and we went down and, and they did a spiritual warfare conference over San Francisco and we went down there to be with them and, and during that time because it was in San Francisco, how many of you know San Francisco is one of the hardest places in the world to bring the gospel, it really is, it's a very challenging place, a very dark place. Yet, you know, I know people that have gone in there that feel called in there, that do things, mighty things for God. But it's still hard. There's a lot of, uh, I think there's, I believe, over that region because how it started, if you study, uh, one of my granddaughters just did a thing on the mission of San Francisco and how it started and when it started and the things that were really released there. There were some things released over that bay and I don't know if you agree with this or not, but if you really look at the, the cities in the New Testament, Ephesus was one of the strongest holds for the enemy. And one of the reasons it was is because it was next to water. And spirits like water. There's, there's, uh, I shouldn't get into all that because I'm sure I'll confuse everybody. But, but because that's a bay and it, and it, and it harbors a certain the storms and different things, I believe because what was released there by the people, because how many of you know Satan doesn't have dominion unless people give it to him? That's right. That's right. There were things released over this city that a lot of people don't understand. This used to be called, and there's, there's, per capita, there's as much money in this city as just probably in almost anywhere in the United States. But the thing is, there's a spirit of poverty over this city. That's because this ridge used to be called Poverty Ridge. Because people came here in the gold rush to get rich. And most of them were poorer when they left than when they came. And if you study anything about this ridge, there were certain, I believe, spirits released over this city that we really have to. Butte County is another one. There were spirits released over this county when they did what they did to the Indian population here. I mean, a lot of people don't study. That's what's wrong with us. We don't see the spiritual world. We see the natural world. And yet we don't understand. We go to a place, everywhere I go to preach, I've been studying Reading. I'm going to be preaching in Reading in a couple of weeks. And I've been studying that up there because I want to know. When I go there, I want to know what I'm going against. Because I don't think we should just take that flippantly. There's more to that than what we realize because what he's saying here is the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But we need to see into the spirit. We need to begin to understand in the spirit there's things happening that if we don't really know how to deal with that, if we don't really go through and really understand why we're going through the what we're going through, how many of you know it will become a stronghold in our life? And we won't even recognize it. Because what he says is the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. In other words, they're not of the flesh. To be carnally minded it literally means to be fleshly minded or to be materially conscious of the world system. How many of you know it's great to have retirement. I have retirement. I want to live good. Of course, I don't think I'm ever going to retire. We don't think so either. I hope God just translates me to heaven, literally. I just go to bed one day and don't wake up and I'm still preaching and I'm still ministering. <laughs> So you, you guys might have some toothless, funny-looking guy up here. Which, guess what? If the anointing's on me, you better not leave me in the name of Jesus. But my heart is, literally, the, the, the thing is, is, all of those things are good. There's nothing wrong with being smart with your money, laying up things that you need when you retire, doing those things. But how many of you know that's not near as important as laying things up spiritually for yourself? 
see, because we live and actually work in the flesh and understand that in this triune being our flesh is always affected, then how many of you know the word says here, we cannot get into a material system that our world is in. Amen. And like I said, there's nothing wrong with owning things, but truthfully, you don't own them anyway. They're God's. Amen. He's just giving you the stewardship. It's like me. I don't own this church. God owns this church. Amen. I am his under-shepherd. I am responsible for what he gives me. I am responsible to handle it right. I am responsible to handle it with integrity. But guess what? When I'm going, I'm leaving it all here. Right. And I'm going to what I've been laying up for years. Yeah, that's right. And so we've got to understand that the weapons of our warfare are not in this world, but they're in the world, but they're from another world. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think, you know, what is unique to me is most people do not understand. In fact, just look at your neighbor and say, you are really peculiar. <laughs> just tell them that. <laughs> Now let me tell you why I say that. Because do you know the human race which was created in the image of God? The reason that you are more peculiar than anything God ever made is because you were created to live in two worlds. You were created to live in two worlds, not one. Everything else. Now, God created angels but they're created to live in the heavenlies. God created the animals. They would live here on earth. But you were created out of all of what God created to live in two worlds. Do you know God wasn't even created to live in two worlds? He was created to come here to help us live in this world. That's why when he sent his son, he finally had to send the ultimate sacrifice through the flesh to accomplish what he needed to get done in the spirit. And a lot of, we're just getting ready to celebrate Easter here in a little while. What a great time for us. Because we get to understand the power of what God did for us. Because I know Pastor Mike has said before, and it's so true, that one word from God can change your life forever. Well, I'm going to tell you, for... 36 years ago, 14 words from God changed my life forever. Hallelujah. At the age of 27, this is what he said to me. If you will go to that Bible study, your life will never be the same. Amen. And I never forgot that. And from that day on, my life was never the same. But let me say something about that. He said, if. Yes. There you go. Yes. It was my choice. That's right. That's right. I could have said yes or no. We have to choose, people, how we fight this battle. Do we want to fight it alone in the flesh, or do we want to fight it with the Holy Spirit and the comforter that comes alongside? Because we have a choice. But every one of us make a choice every day of how we deal with these strongholds in our life. Because I firmly believe every one of us have strongholds that if we don't overcome them, we live in the misery of them. We live in that back country, if you will, of shutting ourselves in. And this is why most people, even that are Christians, when they suffer the stronghold, they suffer a thing called depression and they want to get away from humanity instead of press themselves into God. And listen to me very carefully. This is rampant because I don't think we understand the spiritual world at all. In fact, no. I prepared a, a series I'm going to start after Easter called The Working of the Holy Spirit. Do you know, I think you're very familiar with who Jesus is. I think you're very familiar with who God is. But I think most Christians have no idea who the Holy Spirit is. And he's the third person of the Trinity. And yet we become familiar with, it's kind of like having a tripod and wanting it to, to take a photo of our life and one leg's missing. Because we don't fully grasp what the Holy Spirit's work is, how personal he is, that he is a third person of the Trinity. And so we understand the one leg of Jesus and the one leg of God, but the Holy Spirit, we kind of, well, we know he's supposed to be there and he makes us feel good and we sing in him. But do you recognize when he walks in? Do you recognize when he's drawn? Do you recognize the work he has to do in your life? Because until you get that leg of the tripod, 
your pictures are always slanted because you have a two-legged tripod instead of a three in church so we need to understand because it's in the spirit that we make a difference it's in the spirit that we really fight this battle it's not in the flesh in the Old Testament the prophet understood when he said these words it is not by might nor by power but it is by the Spirit of the Lord that you overcome so I mean if you don't have and recognize and know the power then what you begin to do is this stronghold you fight in the flesh you try to overcome it you try to stay against it you try to resist it but how many of you know until you fight it with the right weaponry it just keeps coming back Good preaching, Pastor. Can I get an amen in this house? So we've got to begin to understand to be carnally minded. But then it says this, mighty in God, which means powerful, strength, and large. Just, just look at your person and say, man, you got a large person living in you. Just tell them that. Some of us have a large person living on the outside of us. Larger than we would like it to be anyway. Somebody, I just felt that. Somebody said, he just insulted me. No, I didn't. I'm going to tell you here in a minute why I didn't insult you. But it's mighty in God. Who is it mighty in? And so if we put anything over God, if we put a stronghold over God, then we'll never be able to do what it says to do, and that is to bring it down or pull it down. If you have something right now that's in your life more important than God, and how many of you know, we all sing the song, Oh, though none go with me, I still will follow. Oh, God's my answer. But how many of us still are fighting it in the flesh? How many of us are still saying, well, it's mind over matter. If I could just get my mind right, well, turn to your neighbor and say, your mind's all messed up. <laughs> you need to renew it in God. And if you don't renew it in God, you don't have a chance. And that's a problem. And so, with that being said, I want to show you something now here because now he's going to begin to show us some real things that really need to understand and what comes against us. And this is what it says. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, let's break that down. Casting down every argument. The word argument means strong debate or contentious. In other words, it says, first of all, there are things that you are going to argue about. Now, let me say this right now. Most of the time, when, and I've done this myself, and I, I agree that it does have to do with that. Argument we consider normally as being a debate against someone else. Or my opinion against their opinion. And how many of you know that I do not think that's the only thing he's talking about there? I think you argue with yourself. Yes. Yes. You want to do what's right, and you know what's right, but you argue about it. Look at your neighbor and say, you're a mess. Just tell them that. <laughs> Bringing down every argument. Would you not agree that we can be double-minded at times? James said, let a double-minded man think he's going to think nothing or receive nothing. A lot of the problem is, is there is still an argument going on inside each of us when there is a stronghold of do we really want to get rid of it? You know, it's like me. I say with the problems, I say, say these words. I say, you know, cry a river, build a bridge, get over it. <laughs> Good counseling, right? Yes. But I like Pastor Mike's analogy. It was a little shorter. Admit it and quit it. <laughs> because how many of you know if you can't admit you got a problem? And most of us know we have it. But let me tell you, it is a stronghold. Now, a stronghold is amazing. And let me just go back to this because it's so important for us to understand. A stronghold is a fortified position or place of defense or defense strength in our lives. And what does he do? He says, pull those down. 
Get rid of those. Pastor Mike showed us the analogy last week. But let me tell you one way you can also figure out if you have a stronghold. And let me tell you how it is. If it's a defensive position, then that means when someone brings that subject up to you, about you, you become defensive. And if it's a stronghold, you will not just be defensive, you will become offended. And when offense comes, it changes your attitude about people. Come on, church, are you here? Because it is a defensive place in our life to where if someone brings that up to us, a shortcoming, a lack, a hurt, and that defense automatically comes to you, that is a stronghold. And what happens is all of us have had that happen to us. Yes. Now it doesn't mean we can't get rid of it, but if you don't be, are aware of it, then you will go through life never admitting you have the problem. I'm preaching real good here. Because we have to understand if it's a fortified position then that, and a defensive position, then that means when we get defensive, that's the same thing. And let me tell you how it works. And it's worked on all of us. How many of you know when you're in ministry, everybody doesn't just love who you are? I mean, you speak before two, three hundred people every Sunday. Ninety-nine percent of all people, you know, are very kind. But every now and then there's somebody that comes along and says, well, have you ever thought of this? Have you ever thought about that? And you know, I remember I used to, and I'm going to be transparent with you, I used to get very defensive. No, sir, not me. <laughs> How many of you know they were right and I was wrong? Yeah. But you can really tell because I had to learn to deal with that because I want to tell you now about the third or fourth time somebody left the church or called me or wrote me a letter I used to really get frustrated I would have sleepless nights literally I would like oh my goodness you know I want to tell you right now, I love you all. But if you leave this church, I ain't losing my sleep over you. I love you and I will miss you. And don't let the door hit you where the good Lord splits you. But if you're supposed to be here, you can't leave. And if you ain't supposed to be here, you can't stay. Why should I lose sleep over that? Because you're the Lord's, not mine in the first place. And this is what happens. We do that for years. And I did that for the first five years of ministry. And finally, this is what the Lord said to me, literally. They're not your people. They're my people. And if they leave, I'll deal with them if it's not right. You just go on with what I've told you to do. And he said, you can't be affected by people. Because the enemy sees that. And he will send enough people in to keep you all stirred up. Your whole ministry, you'll never accomplish what I want to do in your life. Amen. And church, I'm going to tell you, every pastor needs to learn that. Every leader needs to learn that. Every Christian needs to learn that. Because most of the time, our hurts come from people. But what I was doing was I was letting it to start to become a stronghold. I was putting that over the power of God. Is God not big enough? See, when we fear or we have depredation or fear or anger or frustration when somebody doesn't do something we want and we let that affect our life if we leave it in there long enough it'll become a stronghold That's right. That's right. and then anytime that comes up the enemy will make sure somebody brings that up regularly so you can defend yourself oh I'm good yeah. it's because the Holy Spirit's good because I'm telling you, when you read the Word, you need to pray just like I do. You need to read the Word for what it says. It says bringing every argument. Not some, not a few, but even the ones you have with yourself. But you need to bring those into captivity and pull them down because they're really being lifted over what God wants to do in your life or my life. 
And when you do that, what begins to happen is you recognize. And now when those things happen to you, you deal with them differently. You don't let fear come. Because I loved what, you guys who don't come on Wednesday night, you need to come. Yeah. Pastor Mike is doing such a great job on Wednesday night. He said a couple weeks ago, and I will never forget it, every fear has a reaction. That is so powerful. Because when we fear that, and what is fear? That is a stronghold that we don't think God's big enough to take care of. It really is. In other words, we're saying that problem is bigger than the God we have. When how many of you know nothing is supposed to be over God? Come on, church. And so, with that being said, what begins to happen is if you don't deal with it, because I had to deal with it until finally it came out. And truthfully, I think a lot of times as Christians, we can be oppressed by something that is so small and so minor to our life, but then the enemy has us walking in darkness over it. Because it, it's wounded us, it's hurt us, it's disappointed us. Some human has done something to us. And how many of you know that if you let that stay there long enough, it will not just be an offense, it will become now a stronghold to where there is a fortified position in your life. When anybody speaks of that thing, you will become automatically reactive. Now how do you... Well, let me just say this, because I've seen this happen in my own life. I've seen this happen with people. And I've had to learn to deal with it. And I think if you're ever going to lead people, if you're ever going to make an impact for the body of Christ, you've got to learn to deal with this one thing right here. That you cannot please everybody. And that just because somebody gets disappointed with you does not mean you're really not on the right track. Now, there are times when people speak into our life, and they are absolutely right. That we have let something come in, and we are disappointed. But there are other times that there was, a, I've shared this, but I, it just is so relatable because if they don't overcome it, and I don't know that people have or haven't, but especially us as leaders, and I know I have a number of people in here that are called to ministry, but listen to me very carefully. Years ago, I was preaching and I had this man come in the church and he had started a church and he was a great man. I really enjoyed him and his wife. And he preached for us. I asked him to preach. We used to only have one service, and he came in, and he preached Faith Alive. And, and when he left, I, I came out and even listened to him that morning because I wanted to hear what he had to say. I don't normally, I used to didn't come to the first service. I was getting ready, or what we used to call Faith Alive would be like Sunday school for adults. And man, I was sitting in the back back there, and I was thinking, boy, this guy is really good. He is bringing out some real rhema from the Word. And he was. And see, what happens is a lot of times we can do that we can bring Rhema out even, we can, we can sound good to everybody, we can even be on a platform preaching and everything's going great because we're getting the anointing when how many of you know it doesn't really have, I know a lot of people talk about personal anointing and pulpit anointing and, and these things and I mean I believe in that but I do believe that God honors his word no matter, I mean he used a donkey to get his word out there. I mean don't look at anybody but you know there might be a few donkeys out there that, you know, they think they're okay just because they feel the anointing when they get in the pulpit and everybody receives what they have to say. But how many of you know that doesn't mean you don't have some strongholds in your life? Because this man came up, preached, ministered, did awesome. They left and this is all I said. I said, that was really good. What you had to say shook their hand, hugged their neck, walked out the door. That Wednesday I got a letter that said, what kind of a minister did you think I was? Now this man had been ran out of his church, he was hurt by people, and he had let a stronghold come in. And so when anybody said anything to do with that stronghold, what did he do? Immediately he became defensive. See, that what you mean even for good, and when a person has a stronghold, they can take it bad. Amen. That's right. How many of you know that all of us have selective hearing? Yes. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, that which you can mean for good, and you will go, where are they getting that? But the Lord showed me. And truthfully, learn through those things. Because I had to examine my own life and say, Lord, what about me? I stand, church is growing, filling up, building buildings. What about me? Are there strongholds there? If somebody says something to me like that, how would I take it? And I had to do a whole examination, and I wasn't pleased with everything I learned. But I was willing to learn. Because what a stronghold will do, it will stop you from learning. It will stop you from being sensitive to what God wants to do. It will stop you from really having that anointing. You might could even get up and preach and everybody would go, oh, that was great, but you walk out of here and live in misery because of what somebody did. That is not great. Because how many of you know it isn't about the pulpit, it's about my life too. And church, we got to understand, this is why it says, are you all following me? This is why it says every argument, even when you argue with yourself, we can become so defensive about ourselves that sometimes we let a stronghold build up where it becomes a fortified position. And you can always tell, because I want to tell you right now, listen to me very, very carefully. Everybody look at me. Listen to me. If something comes up from your past and you still are defending yourself, Quit it. Get over it and move on. Maybe it was that last man that hurt you or woman. Maybe it was some job that you thought you were the greatest and somebody else got a promotion. Maybe it was a personal situation with another Christian person. Maybe it was a business practice of something that happened in your life. Get over it and move on. Don't let it become a stronghold. Don't let it become something where you become defensive because the moment you become defensive, the enemy has a way in. And the moment he comes in, he will not just let it be a defense, he will build it into a stronghold. And you are the light of the world. You don't need to let any darkness in through the power of God. You have the power in you to cast out darkness. But if you don't recognize that, if you don't become aware of that, if you don't think you have no problems, well, I want to tell you, all of us have problems. So admit it and quit it. And let the Spirit of God move in your life because if you will bring that out, look at this, because what is it really trying to accomplish? What is that stronghold? Is it hurting us? Is it because we won't become great Christians? No. But what it does is it stops us from learning. Because look at what it says next. It says these words. Casting down every argument and high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. See, what the enemy's trying to do is keep you from the knowledge of God. He's trying to keep you from really everything that will set you up for success spiritually in life. Why? Because if you do that... You don't have a proper perspective of discernment. You discern everybody's out to get you. Somebody else is going to hurt me. I will never forget when I first got hurt, one of the first things, like I said, I said this, I said, in fact, even in ministry, when we first started in ministry, we would go to things and, and nobody would reach out to us. And I found it openly coming out of the business world. I found it more hostile than, than the business world. I really did. Christians are terrible. Yeah. I'm going to be great to pastor if it wasn't for people yeah. but it'd be tough to preach to the chairs <laughs> and I say that with all humility but it's true the thing that listen to me very carefully because the thing that begins to happen is the enemy wants to keep the knowledge of discernment from God out of you Because, see, you're hurt, so therefore you cannot filter the words that people are speaking into your life. (coughs) That happens two ways, by the way. I should give you the other way, too, because it's only fair. Be careful of defensive people or you becoming defensive because it makes you hard. But also, does pride. 
Most of you tell me, and really I've had to, I had to learn this, most of you tell me as you leave how great I am, how good I've done, I appreciate your sermons, and do you know how long it took me before I finally said, I used to say these kind of crazy things, oh well you know it's just the Lord, <laughs> and that sounds so spiritual, and that's good, <laughs> but you know what, I just need to say thank you Lord. Because you can't let that stuff attach itself to you. Because it can come the other way too, not just one way. It can come both. You can be built up so much you think you're all of a sudden doing it and you don't need God to get it done. When I'm telling you, I am lost and undone without God. And I could not do what I'm doing without God and Sandy. And that is the truth. Anybody that will live with me needs lots of prayer. <laughs> but listen to me. As we close this morning, church, listen to me very carefully. What the enemy is trying to do when we get offended or we get prideful. I mean, let me tell you why both of those things. It's not only the discernment, but you divide. And the word says, a house divided cannot stand. And church, this is what happens even in marriage if we're not careful. We'll begin to get so prideful or so... Uh, we won't admit fault when we need to. You know, it's called stubbornness. Hard-headedness. But how many of you know, as your spiritual life goes, also goes your natural life. If you'll receive with humility and not let those things in, eventually in your relationships you will learn how to trust. You will learn how to build long time relationships. You, because discernment is huge. But let me tell you right now, you also need to who, who you let speak into your life and you also need to learn who you won't let speak in your life. Because see, why the enemy does that is to rob you from a, the gift that God's given us, which is the spirit of discernment. Because if you have the spirit of discernment, you don't just accept everything at face value. You don't become, I, I don't, you have to be careful too not to, because what happened to me is I said, I don't need anybody. That's the exact words that was out of my mouth 20 some years ago. I said, I'll go back to paradise and build this church and I don't need anybody. And two weeks later, the Lord said, if you lose the heart you have for me, you're not fit for ministry. And so I had to make a choice. Did I want a heart after God? Or did I want to be strong-headed and opinionated and hurt and wounded? And Come on, church, I'm sharing about me. I ain't sharing about you. You can relax. Just look at your neighbors and say, take a deep breath. <laughs> but church, I know how this works because I had to walk through it. And I'm going to tell you, if you'll become wise, we do not have to fall into his pitfalls. The battlefield is out there, but we don't have to fall into that. Because the greater one lives in us, amen? amen. And we have the power to overcome. Do you believe that? Did you get anything out of that this morning? Come on, give the Lord a praise clap in this house.